House needs painting, grass needs mowing, where's he at? Hi, this is Hank. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your name and your number and I'll get back to you. He's gone fishing. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Off the Water with Hank Parker. Hey man, I'm excited today. You know, I've got some great guests lined up for the future, but none greater than what I have coming up today. I'm going to be meeting my buddy, Bill Dance, and I'm so excited. But before I bring Bill on, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, what I know about him and how important he is to our sport. You know, I started this whole podcast, uh, the whole idea is because I wanted to bring to life the history of the individuals that contributed so much to making this sport such an incredible sport. We've got so much new participation today in the tournaments. All of that is wonderful. But I don't want to forget the pioneers that built the foundation to support all that we have going on today. And... Uh, of course, Ray Scott, just so impactful. Uh, what he did is, it couldn't be replaced. Without Ray, we probably wouldn't have anything that we have. Uh, and without Forrest Woods supporting Ray, uh, I don't know that we would have ever gotten very far down the road. Forrest was always a sounding board. Forrest was always there with Ray. They worked together. Forrest built Ranger boats. Ray contributed that, but but Forrest financed a lot of what went on with bass. And so I've talked about Forrest and I've talked about Ray uh, quite a bit, and I'll continue to do that because they were so impactful. But I think Dance is in that league also. Bill Dance pioneered so much about this sport. I mean, he was an incredible angler, and he's one of these guys that's always thinking. He's always analyzing what's going on here and what's going on there. And for him to be able to do what he did as an angler is impressive. But for him to do what he was able to do as an angler while he helped pioneer the idea of bringing sponsors to the professional angler and putting together a television show when there were no television shows on, on a national basis from a professional fisherman. There were a couple of guys, um, Gadabout Gaddis had a show, uh, Virgil Ward had a show, and Jerry McKinnis. All of these guys were, uh, were kind of independent fishermen. Now, Jerry was a professional angler, uh, but he had established himself as a television personality first. Dance came on the scene, and now he's a professional fisherman, and he's going into the studios and knocking on doors and putting together pilot program and building an idea of bringing a professional angler to, to showcase their skills on television. That's pretty crazy. Uh, but he was able to pull that off, and in doing that, it paved the road for Jimmy Houston Roland Martin, uh, Hank Parker, uh, without dance and without that pioneer foundation building that went into effect with all his hard work, uh, it probably would have never happened. So people ask me all the time, uh, who are you most grateful for? Well, I don't know how you to divide that. First of all, the two most influential people that supported me financially and helped me get where I am, number one, Forrest Wood. Number two, Tom Bedell with Berkeley. Uh, but had Ray not built the foundation to have the sport itself, all that would have been vanity. So uh, you can't discount Ray. Had Bill Dance not pioneered and figured out a way to make television come alive for professional anglers, uh, we wouldn't have. So we wouldn't have had that opportunity. So I don't know how you divide. Who is the most important? And it's kind of like the human body. Uh, uh, if you're trying to do something with your hands, your hands are most important. Uh, if you're just looking around, your eyes are most important. If you're walking, your feet are most important. You know, the Bible 
talks about all parts of the body are equally important, the modest parts, the, uh, the, the hands, the head, the ears, the eyes, the nose. I mean, it's all. So I, you, you can't separate the value of your body parts, nor can you separate the value of these guys that pioneered this sport. And that's the whole motivation for me uh, to have, have started this podcast. You know, I brought Bobby Murray on. Bobby won the first classic. He was so instrumental uh, in making things work uh, and, and creating excitement and bringing knowledge, fishing knowledge. And that, that is what people are hungry for. If you're a fisherman, you're always wanting to get better. You're always wanting to learn. You're always wanting to figure out how to catch more fish. Well, that's what the tournaments did, and that's what a lot of these personalities did. And so the biggest personality, the biggest personality uh, in all of our sport is Bill Dance. I mean, that son of a gun is a nut. He's an entertainer. He's a wealth of knowledge. He analyzes things to death. He don't just throw a worm out there and get a bite and think, ah, oh, I got a bite. Now, why was that fish there? What was that fish? And he, he ponders these things in his mind. <laughs> and uh, he's been doing that for so many years. I mean, and he's put it together. So he is just a wealth of knowledge. He is an incredible individual. I think Bill, deep down inside, God gave Bill Dent something when he made him. Bill feels that it's his responsibility to entertain us all. <laughs> I mean, if there is a group of guys that are Bill's friends, we get together, I think he believes in his heart is his responsibility to have us all laughing and all having a good time. And he don't want the party to be dead. He don't want it to be slack. He don't want it to, uh, uh, to not be a good and fun time. And so he feels that's his responsibility. So he'll take over. I mean, you cannot be in a room if it's rolling and Larry Nixon and myself and 15 other fishermen, dance is going to be the life of the party. He's going to take over, and he's going to entertain us. And I think he believes that's his God-given responsibility to keep us laughing and keep us entertained. And it's amazing that he's been doing this for so long. It's crazy that he never runs out of material. He never runs out of ideas. He never runs out of humor. And uh, he's a very serious person on one hand. I mean, he really gets serious. Bill Jr. and the guys that are closest to him that uh, spend time on the water and they video, they'll tell you, he's, man, he gets serious about catching that fish. If he's not catching any fish, he wants to tune you out. Uh, he's like Ricky Clun. You know, Ricky get in a tournament. Uh, Ricky don't want to talk or socialize. Ricky wants to concentrate and get his mind zeroed in on how to catch a fish, and he don't want to be distracted with conversation. Bill is like that when he's shooting a television show. Now, I wouldn't know that. Uh, if if, if uh, Bill Jr. had not told me that, I wouldn't know that about him because, to me, he's always laughing, always jovial, always cutting up. But they say he'll really haunt in now. And when he starts catching fish, he'll lighten up, and then he starts his entertaining. But uh, he, he's got a lot of different personalities. There are a lot of different sides to Bill Dance. One, he's an incredible businessman. Uh, two, uh, he, he pioneered uh, sponsorship for fishermen. Before Bill, there was no endorsement fees paid that I know of to anybody. It, it, Bill brought that to life. That gave me an opportunity to springboard my career because that was put in place and that foundation was built by Bill Dance. So he's just a unique guy, and I wanted to I wanted to to get that clear before I ever bring him on and start talking. I don't want him to hear all this thing. He might really get the big head. But he's one of my best friends. He's one of the guys that I have to look back and say, had it not been for Bill Dance, there probably would not have been a Hank Parker. And that's how much I think of Bill Dance. So uh, uh, as we get prepared to bring my buddy on, I just wanted to give you a little information on how I feel about Bill Dance. I think he's one of the greatest guys that uh, ever held a fishing rod. 
very accomplished angler of the year, the hardest title to win, and uh, he won that multiple times. So what an incredible guy is Bill Dance in so many ways, not just as an angler, not just as a promoter, not just as a television host, but as a friend. So I wanted to clear that up, and now we're going to get ready and bring on my buddy, Bill Dance. Good morning, Bill. It's Hanky Panky Parker, my <laughs> dear, dear friend. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. Hey, do you remember the very first Bassbuster Classic I, I fished with you in 1978? And you and Ray Scott did a thing y'all called Double Talk. You made me look. Oh yeah. Oh, y'all made me look like a dummy. There we were at the most important event of my life. I couldn't imagine the director <laughs> of the sport and the greatest fisherman at the sport at the Bassmaster Classic. Tell us how you came up with the old double talk. What was that about? Uh, it was just just ways to get people, and that was a big big deal with 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 Ray. Uh, he'd do this. He'd get my attention and he'd go. That was a, that was the double talk sign. Uh -huh. And he'd point to the person we wanted to we wanted to blast. Me, the dumb. And, yeah, and I, I can just think of the. Uh, we did it in restaurants. We did it uh, on the boat ramps. We did it at the weigh-ins. We did it at, at meet and greets. Uh, everywhere we went, he would want to do that and. Right. Let me explain to the people who's watching or listening to this podcast what that's all about. Bill would start <laughs> out and he would say, hey, Hank, I wanted to know about, uh, and I would start walking toward him because as he talked, he'd get a little softer. And then as I would get close to him, he'd say, and then I'm going to get up there and then we're going to them, 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 them. And I'd say, what? And then Ray would be on the other side, 50 feet or 100 feet away, and Ray would say, Hank, what Bill is saying, he wants to know about. And so I would turn and start walking toward Ray, and Ray would start talking softer. Then as I got closer to Ray, he would start going, nim, 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 nim. and I'd say, what? And Bill would say, Hank, what Ray is saying. So I would turn around, and then I'd walk back toward Bill. And Bill would say, what Ray is saying, he's trying to tell you this is so important, you need to live something, and then we go, nah, 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 nah. and I'd say, what? And Ray said, come on, Hank, can you not understand what Bill is saying? And I'd start turning and walking back toward Ray, and I'd get closer to Ray, and by the time I got to Ray, he would be going, no, nah, no, nah, nah. and Bill would say, Hank. Well, most people would wise up by then, you know, about yeah. the fifth time. Y'all walked me across that courtyard for 15 minutes. I never did get it. <laughs> you know, he, he loved to do that. And I remember one time uh, we did it to, at that time, one of the most important people in America, uh, George Bush Sr. <laughs> and when, when uh, George Sr. was president, we were down at Ray Scott's. And the Bushes and Ray were very, very close. And one morning, I was out there fooling with my boat, and behind Ray's house, he had a a, a pier or a, a walkway that went all the way around his house and water where you could park your boat anywhere you wanted to park it. And I was sitting there fooling with stuff, and Mr. President walked out, uh, George Bush Sr., and... Uh, said, good morning, good morning, everybody. And Ray was over there going. <laughs> and I said, well, did you get, get to go to the this morning before you got up? Or are you going to try to go to the with the boat this morning? Or we got to get it right? You know, what, what, what would Ray say about that? And he'd look at me like a cow looking at a new gate. And, and he said, oh, oh, I beg your pardon, Bill, I, I didn't hear what you said. And I said, I was just repeating what Ray said. And he said, well, what were you saying, Ray? And Ray said, oh, Bill was, you know, asking. He just repeating when I said. I said, you know, she's got to you get to go to in the morning, but she's got to tell you she with the boat or not. But, but which way do you think it would be? And he said, which, what, 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 what what'd you say? And I said, Mr. President, what he's trying to tell you is that you've got to tell you got in the morning, but you get what you get to do to your boat. <laughs> He's so funny. We talk, you get it up there. Then we just wanted to know what you thought about it. And he said, 
what in the world? And one of the Secret Service guys was standing in the doorway, and he turned and he said, Lincoln, what are these two guys talking about? And uh, Lincoln, the Secret Service guy, he said, Mr. President, I have no idea. <laughs> and he said, let me tell you what, Bill, Ray, you two, you two boys need to go to a speech therapy class. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, she was going to ask him my question, though, Mr. President. He said, hush. <laughs> <laughs> he finally but, caught on. It took me a long oh, yeah, time. Y'all just... walked me around for 15 minutes. Uh, so he was a lot yeah, he stood. He stood there like he was at a tennis match going, won't, 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 won't. And he'd have this funniest look on his face. But uh, I had dinner with him in Houston, Texas. And he remembered that. And he brought it up, and Johnny, Johnny, Johnny was with me, or I was with Johnny, and uh, uh, he brought that up, and Johnny just shook his head. He said, "They do it everywhere. They do it everywhere, Mr. President. They do it everywhere. They just they they sound crazy. They do it in a restaurant. They do it on the lakes. They do it. Uh, they they do it everywhere. They they even got me uh, standing on a boat dock one time." Mm. The only, the only guy alive that ever double talked the president of the United States, you and Ray. Uh, that that two that's two peas in a pod. Yeah. I, and we, and he, he was he uh, George Senior was smart, oh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. he he picked it up fairly quick. But there's some guys that we used to do it too. That we'd walk them all over a parking lot. Billy Primos from Jackson, Mississippi, you know, <laughs> feast tournaments and. Uh, uh, we uh, we did him. We walked him to death, and he finally at the end, he got up to me, and he he said, "You're crazy," <laughs> and he he slapped me. You know his move was crazy. He slapped me, did he not on the not in the face, but just slapped me on the back of the head. And said, "I don't have time for this foolishness," <laughs> and he walked off. Well, I got but, a chance to get you back. Uh, you remember, of course, Al Linder, our buddy, your buddy, my buddy, Al, just such an awesome guy. Al talks about 90 miles an hour. I talk yeah, about, and then some. Yeah, I talk about yeah. uh, 30 <laughs> miles an hour, and you talk about 40 miles an hour. So Al is just so much faster. And uh, old John Roush up at uh, Baxter Advertising Agency yep. sent me a commercial, and he said, I want you to do the read uh, like Al. And of course, I had the commercial uh, in print, and I'm supposed to forward you the commercial just as he sent it to me, but I only forward you the audio part because I knew you wouldn't understand because I didn't have a clue. Had I not had it in print, <laughs> I wouldn't have yeah. a clue. So I sent you that commercial, and uh, John said, I want you guys to do the read in the same time Al did, which was 29 seconds. Well, the natural read for me was about 50 seconds. And so it was no way I could get it in. And at the end, Al was running out of time. So he, <laughs> his read was, and it even works on a jamba bow. And so I sent you that commercial, if you remember, and you looked at that thing and the latter part said, and it even works on a jamba bow. You called me and you said, what is he saying? I said, Bill, can you not hear? He's saying, he, he was on job about. You said, what is he saying? What is that? I said, what is the job about? Yeah. Do you not know what a job about is? And he would say, no, he, I don't he know. Fell, he, That's what he fell off of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you say it? Uh, even worse on job about. They said, and you know, wasn't it for Chicago Cutlery doing that spot? You were doing that spot for? No, it was for Minn Kota. For Minn Kota. Okay, it was for Minn Kota. Yeah, even I know they jump about. Yeah. You said, what now, is that? I said, Bill, you don't know what a jump about is? <laughs> no, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and so the read was, and it even works on a John boat bow. <laughs> Of course, That's I had right. it in and writing, it, and it took you about three hours screaming at me to finally get me to tell you what it meant. <laughs> yeah, he, he fell back 
I remember you telling me that thing a long time ago oh, with the jumbo bat. Good times. But, I, you know, I talked to Al periodically, <clears throat> and I remember when Ron passed away, I, I, I sent a – I had Leslie send a reef up there, and the people that did the reef was just beautiful. It, it was a, a bass made out of flowers and uh, a fishing rod on this reef. And it was just, it was, I mean, it was beautiful. That's and awesome. they got that. They put it up next to, to Ron, uh, where, where he was resting, you know. And Ron was another one that could go 90 miles an hour. Ron Lender, you know, Al's brother. Oh, man, talk. I can't understand he said, him. He said, Bill, Bill, I need to talk to you, Bill, <laughs> Bill, Bill. I said, okay, what's up, Ron? Oh, you know, Bill, Bill, you know, uh, Hank's been under a lot of pressure lately. All these cold winters up here have been just unbelievable, and the ice has been so thick we can't do very much. And what Al needs, Bill, is, uh, is uh, you know, he leaves a little R&R. &R. And I said, okay. And he said, you know, your buddy down in Florida that has those big lakes. And I said, yeah, he's in charge of land reclamation for a big phosphate company. And he said, yeah, yeah, Bill, that's the one. Al went down and fished with him years ago, and he'd like to go back uh, for some R&R &R and, and fish with your buddy, fish with your buddy, and jerk some jaws. And I said, and so what? And he said, it's got a little R&R &R where, you know, Al can just spend a day and just relax and jerk some jaws. And I said, what is, what is what? I said, what, jerk some jaw? I said, what is jaws? And he said, you know, the, the, you know, the bass, he has jaws. And I said, oh, jerk some jaws. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what he needs. So you need to call your buddy. You need to call your buddy. And get this set up for me right away. Will you do that for me, Bill? Will you do that for Al? Because Al has just been under so much pressure, Bill. And I said, okay. So oh, that's he, crazy. he, he, he uh, Barry didn't like people just hooking fish <laughs> after fish after fish after fish. And he, uh, he told Al that the first time he went down there and he said, you catch a few fish off a spot, leave it alone and move on to another spot. Don't just beat it to death. And uh, so I told, I told Barry, I said, Barry, uh, Ron wants to come down with, uh, and bring Al down for some R&R &R and, and jerk some jaws. And Barry said, what? And I said, he wants to come down and fish uh, and uh, maybe shoot some pictures and just relax. And he needs some R&R &R and, and, you know, time to spend fishing and just to be able to find a place where he can catch lots of fish and jerk up and drop some jaws. <laughs> and uh, Barry said, I like Al Lander. But that brother, his Ron, <laughs> I told him, I said, look, if you want to jerk some jaws, you go over there on the coastline and jerk some jaws on those sheep heads. <laughs> but anyway, oh, uh, that's so funny. They, they talk so fast, you know, up there, you know, Bill. Have you fished a condom? <laughs> what, have you used the third, six, seven, 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 I had no idea what Roddy was talking about. Absolutely. And Bill, we got that real father. He's going to take up to the test line. You know, it's a good real Bill. It's a good, call good grocery spell. That's a wonderful, wonderful combination there. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it sure is. Oh, and I'd look at He would just, they were 90 miles a minute, like he said. Man, they started the In Fish magazine. They did so much for the yeah. sport. And, you know, talking about all of that, you go back not only to Ron and Al Linder, uh, Cotton Cordell. Cotton Cordell was such an instrumental guy. Uh, Bill Norman, uh, Tom Mann. Uh, you knew all of these guys. Your buddy Billy Westmoreland. Uh, you, you go back. Uh, tell me a little bit. And then you started, you actually became uh, owner, you and Charles Spence, with Strike King. So yeah. your, your, your relationship with not only the fishermen, but you had a relationship with almost everybody that, uh, whether it's a boat company 
uh, whether it was a lure company, rod company, reel company, you've had relationships with almost all the pioneers. And that's what I, when I started this podcast, Bill, I did it because I wanted to let the world know uh, who all the people were that helped build the foundation to get the sport where it is today. And I think out of the, the, the Mount Rushmore uh, figures on the mountain, uh, it, it's Ray Scott, Forrest Wood, Bill Dance, and uh, well, we would decide. If I was up there, the mountain would fall in. <laughs> You'd be the first one with sunglasses on, I can tell you that. Uh, yeah, hello. But we'd have, oh, you got eyes. It'd be the fourth. Yeah. I don't know who that would be. Maybe you can help me determine who that fourth guy would be. But let It'd me be ask. Carl Lorenz. Carl Lorenz. All right, you knew Carl. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about Carl. Carl, Carl started uh, with the little green box. And uh, the little green box, he sent me one. And he told me, he said, Bill, we'd like to sponsor you. And I said, well, I'd love to have Lawrence as a as a as a depth finder sponsor, and uh, he said, "Well, let's let's get it done." And I said, "Okay." So he sent me the little green box. Ah, be darned! And I've I've still got that original original unit, and uh, it. Uh, see if I can open it. Yeah, that's the one, one he time. sent you. The first one you ever saw. Well. Not exactly. Um, well, can you see in there? <laughs> I can't. But anyway, um, I'll show you what's it, what it actually looked like. The little fish locator is the name of it. But but Carl's big deal was it wasn't a depth finders. Every time he called me, he raised spring lizards. And he kept telling me how good they would be to fish with, you know, for small mouth oh, over yeah, these Tennessee yeah. lakes. And I said, Carl, I can't use salamanders in a tournament. But he said, I'm going to send you a bunch, and I want you to do this, this, this. And remember, they've got to stay in a cool temperature. And I said, Carl, look, I like you. I love you. And I appreciate your uh, support. And, and I, I appreciate the little green box. Oh, yeah, there it is. So and, it's a uh, flasher, a portable flasher is what it amounted to. That's it. And it did a good job. Of course, I didn't know how to read it, but it still did a good job <laughs> uh, for Carl's especially. But I finally got to where I could use it pretty well. But he called right in, at night just out of the blue. And he'd say, uh, how's it going? I said, everything's going fine. It, you're depth finder's working okay? I said, everything's working fine. He said, well, we got a big order from so-and-so. You were promoting that uh, in a show about a week ago. I said, uh, I'm glad to hear that. Somebody's watching. And, uh, <laughs> but I was fortunate back in those days. I, I, I got to meet Carl, and I got to meet Van, Van Ellis, who ran Bomber Bait Company. And I fished Bomber Baits uh, way, way back on and um, and then as time rolled along, working shows, my dream was slowly but surely becoming a reality. And meeting these guys and like Bill Norman, Cotton Cordell, uh, old Jim Bagley. Oh man, Jim was now, you a great. Jim, you guys really hit it off. Y'all were good guys. I know you flew in his helicopter and you you fished. You wore Bagley hats. Uh, not a hat, but a Bagley shirt. You always wore that Tennessee hat. I'm getting confused. But I know you worked with Jim for a good number of years, and he was a real innovator. I mean, the old uh, uh, Bangalore and uh, the DBs and all that stuff. It was uh, honeybees. He had so many unique uh, balsa wood baits. It was a lot of innovation in those days, and you were right there that whole period. Well, Bagley was a was was a great guy, and I got to where when I went down to Florida to shoot shows with a, a particular guest, I wouldn't even call back. I didn't even want him to know I was in Florida because <laughs> he he was so he had such a tremendous way about him the southern hospitality just just glowed from him 
And he said, you need to, my helicopter to shoot some uh, aerial shots. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, 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 where are you going to be? And I told him, he said, I'm going to bring lunch over there. And people like Jerry Reed, Roy Clark, and uh, Porter Wagner, and a lot of those old timers, uh, they would say, we're here, but don't tell Bagley. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim was, Jim, Jim was just, he was a great sponsor, a great friend. He called, he called me at night, and he wanted to talk to Diane about books. And Diane's a big book reader, and so was Bagley, surprisingly. And they'd sit and talk on the phone 30 minutes to an hour about different books they'd read. And she was just crazy about him. He was just a wonderful, wonderful person. And Lee Wolf, go back to the old days with Lee Wolf and uh, Mark Sosen. Now, who uh, was Lee Wolf? I know Mark real well. Lee Wolf I... was a big, big promoter, a big writer, a tremendously big writer back in those old days. Where was he from? And he uh, uh, and his wife, Joan, she was a, a, a fly fishing, uh, she just loved to fly fish. But anyway, um, Lee was very well known in fishing circles like Kurt Gowdy. Remember Kurt? Oh, yeah, I remember him well. With ABC, with ABC Sportsman Show. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but anyway, in doing the work that I dreamed that I wanted to do, I got to meet all these people at tackle shows. And I made it a point to go and talk to them and, uh, uh, and got a sponsorship from them, oh, from yeah. Lawrence to Bagley to Cordell. to And I even went to work. After several years with Strike King, uh, I was doing all the, getting all the press and, Charles was sitting there working while I was out fishing. And I could tell it bothered uh, Charles when writers would call me and say, Glenn Saper with Field and Stream or Mark Sosen with Sports of Field at that time and different writers. And, and they wouldn't include Charles. And I said, Charles, look, I'm out promoting the bank. But one of us has got to do it. And they called and they asked me to do it. Do you want to do it? And he said, no, no, no. I just, I think I ought to tag along. I said, well, who's going to make the baits? And who's going to work, keep the factory running on spinner baits and other things that we came out with at that time. But it got to a point where it just, I felt sorry for Charles. I really did. He wanted to fish. Well, no, he wanted, he wanted the attention like I was getting. And uh, I finally, we departed, we parted good ways and, uh, and then became very, very close later on. Charles became a sponsor of uh, Bill Dance Outdoors. And our friendship, we, he's the only sponsor that I had that all we had, we didn't have a contract. We did, all we did together and we did a bunch of things together sunglasses for Walmart and our all those good days. Oh yeah. They uh, mm. uh, were absolutely tremendous. And for Charles and Strike King. And that relationship lasted up until Charles passed away. Um, and then Ray Mursky of course took over Strike King at that time. But I moved on and uh, I worked for Cotton. And Cotton was like Cotton the Cordell, easiest. man. We're talking about Cotton Cordell. We're changing gears. We're leaving. Uh, we're leaving Strike yeah. King. We're going over to Cotton Cordell. All right. Yeah, they were competitors, but I went to work for Cotton and doing the same thing that I wanted to do uh, for Strike King, and that was fish with riders, take buyers out fishing, and uh, educate them on the new products that we had. And Cotton saw the importance of that. And he said, one day, he said, you know what we need? I said, what's that? He said, we need a television show. And I said, that's a great idea. I know the perfect guy to do it. He said, who's that? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I said, who's that? Or he said, who's that? And I said, uh, the best guy I know would be Jerry McKinnis. 
And you remember Jerry? Oh yeah, I remember Jerry well. He had he was along there with Virgil Ward doing a show, and yep. Jerry's yep. show was real, real popular. And I used to, I spent a lot of time with Jerry, and used to go with him on on shoots, on film shoots, and uh, we roomed together at a lot of the tournaments. We became very, very good friends. And I know, give him credit right now, he's another one. It helped me tremendously, and I don't think I'd be doing the TV that I'm doing today without people like Jerry. Jerry helped me a lot. But anyway, uh, after working with Cotton for several years, we got a call from, I got a call from a syndicator in St. Louis, and Don, St Don St Stokes or whatever, and he asked me, would you like to syndicate your show in the 50 network markets? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> and we, I said, duh. And we did. And then we increased it up to 90 network markets. And that rocked along for a period of time. And I was still doing a local show in Memphis. And I had one in Jackson, Mississippi, a local all show. Right. Let me interrupt you right there for just a second. All right. Yeah. You've got all that going on. You've got all that going on while you're still competing in fishing tournaments. You're trying to juggle all these balls. You're working with cotton. You're now doing television. You're taking outdoor riders out and, and entertaining and getting them involved to promote the particular companies that are sponsoring. How did you keep all those balls up in the air? I... When I was fishing tournaments, I started my television show, and I know how difficult that was. And what you're doing is even way more time, uh, including more of your time than what I did. I, how did you do all that? Well, I really don't know. I know Diane told me one time, she said, in the month of April or May, she said, you slept, you slept in our bed five nights the whole month because I was just going like this, wow. but I was writing, scripting, shooting, editing those, those local shows. And I kept, I dropped Baton Rouge, WBRZ channel two down in Baton Rouge. And then the ABC affiliate in Jackson, Mississippi. And then we had a show we ran out of Pat Paducah, Kentucky, JC Penny was in the, Sporting good business too. They yeah, they sold yeah. fish and tackle way back younger, and I was doing two well four markets, fifty two weeks a year, two hundred and eight shows a year, and then starting a syndicated show. And I said I, I can't and fishing the tournaments and still fishing with writers and still I was just going like this, but it was really helping my career. Uh, the people I met along the way and looking back to the Carl Lawrence's, the Van Ellis's with Bomber, Cotton Cordell with all his great lures that he made, Jim Bagley with all those great baits. Um, How about Bill Tom Norman. Mann? I know you worked with Tom Mann for a while. Tom was my good well, Tom, buddy. Tom and I were real close. I and know he, was a, he was a great sponsor and more fun to be with. And I remember Tom told me one time, he said, Ever tell you about the time I fell out of a tree and uh, broke my leg? And I said, no. He said, it was back during the Depression. I was up in a persimmon tree, and uh, I slipped on a limb and fell out. And I said, were you eating persimmons for breakfast? He said, yeah, and it was the delight because that's all the money we had. We didn't have a lot of money. So we had to, <laughs> he just constantly having jokes, broke his leg, eating breakfast, falling out of a persimmon tree. <laughs> But, Hank, you know Tom, and you know what, you, you, he sponsored you, I think. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, all the good times and the fun times that uh, Tom and I had. But all of this uh, grew bigger and bigger and bigger as a result of one man, and that was Ray Scott. Ray started BASS, and I remember when he started it, uh, I got invitations to come to his very first tournament and I'd never met Ray Scott, but I'd talked to him on the phone and I'll fast forward real quick here. I was on Pickwick Lake one, one March 
one March, a late March day, back in 1966, I believe that was. And his first tournament was at Beaver Lake in 67, June of 67. So I met him about a year before, and he was promoting the tournaments. And Diane and I, I had a little John boat with a little 20 mark on it. And uh, we were fishing up this bank, and I see this Skeeter boat come zoom, 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 flying across the lake with a 60 horse, 60 horse Mercury on the back of it. And it said, Glenn Andrews, world champion fisherman. And I looked at it, and they stopped and started idling to me. Now, I had met Glenn at a Memphis boat show, sports show. And he had these big trophies that a circus dog couldn't jump over. And <laughs> I walked up to him and said, I said, you're a world champion fisherman. He said, yeah, that's what they say. I went up. And I got to talking to him. And the more I talked to him, he just had soft-spoken, tremendous, tremendous, best bass fisherman I ever met. You can ask Houston or Roland about him. Uh, they'll all tell you he was the best deep water fisherman they ever met. But he was sitting in the boat, and a guy from our wildlife commission was running the boat. And they pulled up, and Ray was, yes, Bill, I, you know, we've talked several times. I said, glad to know you, Ray. Glad to meet you. You're going to fish our first tournament, aren't you? And I said, I'm going to sure try. Well, you've got to be there now. you got to be there. I said, okay. And I wanted to talk to Glenn a little bit. And Glenn said, let me tell you this. See that point right there? And I said, yeah. He said, that's a creek channel point, Bill. I said, a what? What's a creek channel <laughs> point? And he says, where the creek comes in and hits it and turns off of it. If you'll put, how have you slip sinker you're fishing? I said, a uh, quarter ounce. He said, put you on a three eighths and go up, ease up to the edge of that point. And you should be in 35 feet of water. And as you move out just a little, when you get to about 50 feet of water, make you a long cast way out off that point. And I said, okay. And just work the worm real slow. Now, wait a minute. Said, Hold on. Had you ever fished that deep before in your life? No, no. That's what I'm getting at. I, oh, yeah. No. Never, ever fished that no, deep. No, no. I, I, I said, and he said, get up there and throw way out on that point. And you'll, the end of that point where it drops off is about oh, 19 to 22 feet deep or 17 to 20 feet, whatever it was. And I said, what? I said, 20 feet deep? Well, I grew up fishing around cypress trees in the Mississippi River bottoms, oxbow lakes and stuff. And I said, if I caught a fish eight feet deep, I thought the fish was crazy or suicidal and to bite in eight feet of water. I never dreamed. And I said, are you telling me that y'all caught fish this morning? He said, yeah, we had a couple of good fish, uh, about a five pounder and a six pounder. How many did we catch? All right. Ray said, We caught about 12, 14, about 12 or 14. I said, How deep? And he said, We caught those in 24 feet of water. I said, I went, uh, uh, uh. So I started to get a lake. I went, 20, 24 feet of water. He said, Yep, on a worm. And I went, My gosh, here on Pickwick Lake. It looked like I fished all, a lot. He said, yeah. He said, you throw right out there, and uh, I think you'll catch, find, you'll find you some bass. Y'all want to go to breakfast? I said, yeah, we, we will. He said, well, we'll meet at such and such in an hour. Well, I took that worm, put a 3 8 sinker on it, and threw it out there. It was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Counted it down a foot a second, and it was on the bottom. And I went, twitch, 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 twitch. And something went, boom, 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 boom. And I went, whoop, whoop, whoop. And I started reeling. And it jumped. It was about a two and a half pound bass. And wow. got him up in the boat. And doo, 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 doo. I pulled him out of the water. And I said, Diane, look. Look what your husband just did. And she said, you know what I just did? And she said, well, yeah, you just caught a bass. I said, no, no. Listen to what I'm telling you. You know, that bass came out of 24 feet of water. I never in my life have caught a fish that day. I, wow. I, I, I can't believe this. And I mean, I was shaking. And I threw it back and, went, 
and whoop, and I went bang, doo, 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 and brought him in. He was another one about two and a half pounds. I said, oh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, <laughs> this is a big one. And I said, I, this is just unbelievable. Wow. This is just unbelievable. And right then, I, I could feel a, a, it was a mixed emotion coming, kind of coming to going out and coming back in, going out and coming back in. And I said right then, if I'm going to fish tournaments, I got to do something that the other fishermen aren't doing. I've got to learn how to fish deep water. I've got to do that to be real competitive. Well, now let me and ask most you. Every fish I knew, did Glenn find those fish with the old Buck Perry trolling spoon, or did he have the little green box? He just pulled up on the point. He had he had a unit called a sonar. It was, it was a sonar made by sonar, but the sonar manufacturing company. Uh, I had one too now, right after I met. Hold on, sonar manufacturing. Did they did they have the first depth finder? I thought the little green box was the first depth finder. It was not. Now they uh, there was a unit uh, called Sonar, and it was designed for saltwater. Carl had the first freshwater unit with the fish locator, and uh, Glenn was using a Sonar unit for freshwater, but he he was unbelievable uh, how good a fisherman he was. And so after I caught a couple of fish, I said. I just, I, I didn't know what to say. I said, I reeled my bait in and I said, let's go eat, let's go meet them and eat breakfast. Well, Glenn and I became real good buddies right then. And so he Ray, told me, Ray nailed you down at that breakfast, man. Uh, you were going to be at Beaver Lake. He, he probably nailed you down and made sure you was going to be there. Yeah, he said, are you going to fish the tournament at Beaver? And I said, absolutely. He said, I want you to think. I want you to think. Strategy wins tournaments. Do something different than anybody else. And he said, I can tell you, most fishermen I meet are shallow water fishermen. They like to throw at a stump or throw at a willow top or, you know, objects, lay down, whatever it is along the shoreline, which was a productive way because that's really the only way we knew how to fish. Yeah. But I moved offshore and he told me to get a topo map. And I said, what is a topo map? <laughs> a topographical map and try to get it in the smallest intervals you can get. It's going to show you more than a 20 foot or a, a, a 10 or a 15 or a 20 foot. And I said, Glenn, I'd have no idea what you're talking about. So he, he explained it to me and I, I, I got a, I got a, a map of Pickwick and believe it or not, it was an old old map I got from recreational properties in Tennessee. It showed five foot intervals with a two and a half foot intervals, uh, auxiliary intervals. And I could, he said, the tighter the lines, the faster the drop. Fish like to hang close to deeper water. Even though they're in deep water, they still want to be closer to deeper water. And um, I started fishing that way. And I had me a line compass, didn't have GPS then. And at a line compass, so I'd take a 90 degree reading off two angles and pick an object. Maybe it was a barn and a big oak tree behind it. And then the other way, it would be some other two uh, objects that were identical that were separated. But you could line those two up with those two up. And right there is where you, where you caught the fish. Now I'd throw a buoy out right there. And uh, a marker buoy. Sure enough. Huh? Throw out a marker buoy right there on the little spot. Yeah, and I'd work all around that, and I, I'd catch fish or I didn't catch fish, but I didn't forget that spot. And when I'd find fish, I'd give it a name. And anyway, I was slowly but surely learning how to fish deep water and catching lots of fish doing it. Not as, not as many big, big fish, but good-sized fish, tournament-winning sized bass, you know, two and a half to four pounds. And occasionally I'd catch a big one. But anyway, I was learning and changing my whole direction in life. I so was so you had you had been fishing Pickwick Lake for years before you ever met Glenn Andrews and now right. 
Now that you figured out you could catch a bass in 24 feet of water, you're going to relearn how to fish. You're going to take your and change your strategies completely. Absolutely. And that's Absolutely. what you did, and you got in the tournaments, and you started kicking high end. Well, I, I remember Ross Barnett. Well, I, I take this back. The first, it's a long time ago. Like I told you, the hardest three years of my life was the first grade, <laughs> and I failed it. But this was way back yonder. I remember going to, uh, listening to what Glenn told me, I remember going to Ross Barnett, and I won that tournament. And the next tournament Ray had was at Rayburn in Texas, Sam Rayburn Reservoir. Yep. At Ross Barnett, I was catching my fish uh, 14 to 18 feet of water and way off the bank. I went to Rayburn, and it was the same thing. I found structural features all way off the bank. And I won that tournament, and then we went back to Smith Lake in Alabama, and I won that tournament. And now things were just really opening up. Oh, yeah. I had a call from Head and Lure Company. I had a call from Bagley Lure Company. And I had a call from uh, Ken White at, at Cream Lure Company. And knowing that 50% of the fish I was catching every year was on a plastic worm, Nick and Cosmo Cream wanted Diane and I to come down there and spend the weekend with them. So we flew down to Shreveport. Glenn picked us up, and then we drove up right on over to Tyler, Texas, where Cream Lure Company was. And Nick was such a, he invented the plastic worm. And Nick was such an enjoyable type person. And Cosmo Cream, Diane just fell in love with her. And they'd go shopping or whatever they did. And I'd go to the plant with Nick, and he'd show me various baits and stuff I needed to fish with. But anyway, I learned to fish deep water, and I took a job with uh, Cream at that time. And uh, I stayed with the worm, and I went to that very first tournament, and I found my fish, the majority of my catchable fish were in 17 feet of water. And I caught a limit the first day, I caught a limit the second day, and I was in first place first day, first place the second day. But the third day, Stan Sloan out of Nashville beat me by about a pound, a pound or so. But I did catch a limit every day, and I caught them all in deep water. But uh, although I lost the tournament, I didn't win the tournament, but I learned how to fish deep water. I was learning more and more and more about it. And I remember a classic over your way on uh, Lake Kiwi. Clark's Hill. I and, remember Clark's Hill was, uh, you finished second. Oh, it was Clark you, Hill. It was Clark yeah, to, to, yeah. To, I told you. Yep, you finished Clark second Hill. to Rayo Breckenridge. Rayo, what a great guy was Rayo. And you finished second in that classic. Almost won that classic. That yeah, I thought I had won it. I yeah. thought, I was, my observer writer was Charlie Searcy. I wrote from Tennessee and, and Nashville. The National Tennessean uh, newspaper. And I found those fish. They were 38 feet deep wow. on a long point that ran out, out of, from the mouth of a creek where the river uh, skirted right in on it. And started out that first day, I caught a limit. And I was the only one that day to catch a limit. And second day, uh, I went right back to it, and those fish had moved from 38 feet to about 45 feet. Wow. And it was a big, big, massive school of fish, all bass, and I used a slip sinker worm. I know I didn't. I used a Carolina rig, and I only had three packs. At that tournament, you could only bring 10 pounds of tackle. That's right. Remember? That's right. I remember those well. That was the same thing I went through. Ten pounds of tackle, yeah. that was it. I just threw those floating worms in there because I used them in Florida up in those runs, up in Salt, salt Run and Juniper Springs and Salt Run Springs to catch those shallow water bass. But anyway, I, I threw them in there just for the heck of it. I said I might be able to use them. But I ended up using them. And I started with nine, three to a pack. And... The um, 
uh, last day of the tournament, Charlie was with a cigarette lighter, was melting them and putting them together and sticking them down in the water and fusing them back together. And I'd weed them back on the hook, keep, throw it out, maybe catch three or four fish. And we'd have put that in the hospital and I'd get another one. And he'd be giving it surgery. And ta 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 ta. So I got you another one. And I ended up the last day of the tournament. I hung a bass. Uh, he wouldn't weigh five pounds, but he wouldn't miss it much. Uh, Kurt Gowdy, Bruce Buckley with the American Sportsman yep. pulled up and he said, uh, Are you doing any good? And I said, wait a minute, boom. And I set the hook, and this four-pounder, five-pounder, whatever, it jumped straight up in the water, fell back in the water. I said, golly. And they were getting all this on, on film. They didn't have video back there, it just film. And I got the fish and brought him around, and they said, let him jump one more time. Oh, no. <laughs> and I knew I shouldn't do it. I know for a heck, I learned the biggest lesson of my life, and I said, uh, he went down onto the boat and came back up and he jumped. And they said, ah, we got it. But uh, you lost he, threw the, he threw the hook. I lost him. Uh, and uh, Or he pulled the hook. And that fish, when I weighed in that third day, I caught a limit every day. And the only glory I had, I, no one else caught a limit. Uh, I limited all three days. But anyway, the... Uh, that was the hardest thing that, that when I weighed in, everybody said, Bill, you got it. Congratulations and everybody. But Rayo Breckenridge had not weighed in yet. And he broke down about a half a mile from the weigh in. And Roland came by and hooked to him and pulled him in. And when he, when he weighed in, he beat me by just a, a couple of pounds. I felt like, I don't know how what death feels like, but I felt like I was going to die at that moment. And Diane used to always say, everything happens for a reason. She used to tell me that all the time. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I, I just, I'm trying to smile and cry at the same time. Uh -huh. But I walked over and I shook hands with uh, uh, Rayo. And then I stomped his toe where no one could see me. <laughs> and then I did. But I told him. Uh, uh, and I walked back and Diane grabbed my hand. She said, I'm going to tell you something that you don't know. I said, what? You know, Rayo's a farmer. And they've had two bad years. Cotton, beans, and whatever the red cotton's corn. He's had two really bad years. And Maryland... He used to say, boy, I hope the girls all get together in yeah, Maryland. Mayo's so, life, Maryland, yeah. Yeah, Maryland, I'm sorry. And uh, she said, I sure hope Rayo can win this tournament because he does. Uh, I, we need the money where I can maybe save my sight. And Diane told me that, and I said, what? And she said, yep. She Prayed that Rail would win it because if he did, they'd have enough money for her to, to her save her sight, basically. Yeah. Wow. And when she told me that, that agony of defeat just it left. Wow. And I said, her sight is more important than me winning this tournament. And I, I, I could not get over the fact of how I felt when I first uh, when Dan told me that. And then she looked back. And I started to walk over. And she pulled me back. And she said, remember what I told you? Everything happens, happens for a reason. reason. Oh, that's funny. And, well, you but got, anyway, you those look, early days were great. huh? I love these stories because it tells the character of the guys that built the foundation. What? It was an innocent time. It was when friends were friends. Even though you were competitive, uh, you were friends then you retired in 1982 or whenever it was, 80, I think 1980 may have been your last Bassmaster Classic. Last year you competed. You made the Classic every year you competed. Uh, life changed at the tournament circuit. You were always the life of the party, and we all missed you, but you never stopped. You kept going. So you've always been promoting. You've always been doing TV. How many years in television right now? 
56. 56 years. This is my 40th year. I'm celebrating my 40th year in television this year. 56 for you. And uh, you started the Bill Dance Saltwater Show. Now, don't lie to me. I want you to be honest. <laughs> You, okay. start, you started that show where you could get away with going fishing more often without Diane fussing at you. Is that not true? Yep. I, I, I told her, I said, Diane, look, this is my job. And uh, so I'll be at uh, my Pickwick branch office uh, Monday and Tuesday, and then I'll be down in Gunnersville a Wednesday uh, at, at my office down there. And then I, I'll be coming back through. Uh, Memphis on my way down to Lake Washita or <laughs> down there. But I mean, I was going like that, just going crazy. But the tournaments were a major stepping stone for, for Bill Dance, a major stepping stone. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, the, learning to fish deep water was the key to it. And I won, won several, quite, it was in the top 10 quite a few times. Uh, and won seven, I think. I won yeah, seven BASS tournaments and other tournaments, smaller tournaments. Dewey Yop had a tournament series called National Bass Circuit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. And ended up in, in that career of winning 23 tournaments and uh, seven, and then I won seven BASS tournaments, and then I won Angler of the Year three times. And yeah, that's a big that more, that, that is the that number one Roland time. Morgan got on the scene, and uh, Roland Martin. And he uh, started, he dominated the field. And then right after Roland, here comes Kevin Van Dam. But <laughs> we just change positions every year. But Well, the whole time uh, you're fishing, you know, I tell these kids, I, I work a lot with high school kids, and I'm really... You do, yeah. I'm really big in the high school fishing. I hope we can get that thing really to continue to grow and grow and grow and uh, get better. It, it, it's the preservation, of course, the future of our sport. So I, I'm really involved in that. But I tell kids all the time, you got to love it. I mean, you got to love it. It's got to be a passion. It's got to be something. That's exactly right. And, and you're the they're the greatest example. You don't even know this. I called Bill Jr. the other day. I called Bill Jr. trying to track you down. And I said, Junior, where's your dad? He said, he's down there fishing. I said, what's the temperature in Memphis? It's hot as the dickens here. He said, oh, it's about 100 degrees. I said, well, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, how long has he been down there? He said, oh, he got down there at daylight. I said, well, when he gets back, tell him to call me. He said, oh, he won't get back till dark. I said, is he doing television work? Oh, no, he's just fishing for fun. So here you are in 100 degree weather, you fish catfish tournaments. I called you the other day, you was going to a catfish tournament. It's a 100 degree day in Memphis, Tennessee, and you're on the lake fishing for fun. I don't know that anybody loves fishing half as much as Veal Dance. You're, you're eat up with it. Well, I love it. And I live in an area where I'm blessed with uh, so many great, great lakes. Tennessee has such a variety of, of, of waters. They were so diversified from our mountain lakes in East Tennessee to our Midland lakes in Middle Tennessee to our lowland lakes, uh, watershed impoundments. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to, you know, I fish for bluegill, fish for crappie, fish for bass. I put bass on a pedestal. But the tournaments that I fish now are catfish tournaments on, on the Mississippi River, the uh, Ohio River, uh, the Tennessee River. And I really love doing that. I really do. That competitiveness comes back uh, fishing those catfish tournaments. And we did well, uh, really well in the early days until these catfish started realizing the importance of certain techniques, certain type of hooks, lines, rods, depths, uh, what, what, how to fish current in shallow current, transitional seam waters, 
or to real deep water. So we fish the cat, you know, catfish through the say summer months on into the fall months. But I fished a two hundred thousand dollar one about a month ago, and uh, I got I got sick the day before the tournament. I got COVID, and we were on catfish. We had we had a good pattern on down in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and. But I got COVID and I was sicker than a barnyard mule. I, <laughs> ooh, I, it, I've had it before, but I didn't have it anything like I had it about a month ago. I had it for two weeks and stayed in and almost went crazy. You um, didn't get to fish for two weeks. You went two solid weeks without wetting a hook. Diane wouldn't let me out of the house. Wow. Oh, she'd throw a, she'd throw a fit if I, <laughs> I left the house. So. Well, that's never bothered you before. You've always gone fishing anyway. It didn't matter. <laughs> I tell you one thing. Two old boys was, was a, that I was. We we fished together. Won several good tournaments together. They they farm up at Ripley, Tennessee. They fish down the Mississippi River bottoms, and are, uh, they raise. Uh, they farm cotton. They farm beans, they farm corn, and we get to fish a lot together, and they're right there on the bank of the river, and I'll go up and meet, meet them and on days after a big rain when they can't get in the fields, and I've learned a lot uh, from them about places I catch them. We've become kind of a team in these tournament events. Uh, all, and the, I told, uh, all the catfish tournaments, team tournaments, not individual tournaments. You you have a partner and you, you weigh your fish in as a team. Yeah, as a team. There's three of us fish together. Okay. And uh, we've been fortunate. Uh, I know there was a spree several years back. We fished the Carl Perkins benefit <laughs> tournament. Carl Perkins was entertainment. Oh, yeah. no, Carl. And uh, for the Carl Perkins Museum. It was a fundraising event. We won it four years in a row and then finished second in the fifth year. But we were a team and we won it together and we kind of stayed together as a team fishing. Uh, and I love to do that because right here, it's our biggest fish, the catfish. Oh, yeah. So you can move further east. We get into stripers, you know, rockfish, big fish. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then, but we're real blessed in this state that we have. We're so diversified in the fact that we have beautiful reservoirs, beautiful rivers, tons of small creeks. And I still love running water. I love to fish running water in the hot summer months. So right now you've got Bill Dance outdoors. You go crappie fishing. You catch bluegill sometimes. You catch bass. Then you got Bill Dance saltwater. When you catch all different species of saltwater fish, and you travel all over the Florida and all over the country fishing saltwater. Now you're fishing catfish tournaments. Are you ever gonna slow down? Well, somebody asked me how long I plan on doing this. I just said I hope to do it forever. And then a little bit more. <laughs> it's really, I tell you, Hank, it's really the only life I know. It's what I've always done. It was a dream. It was a passion. I wanted to get in this business somehow. And uh, meeting some of those pioneers, old timing pioneers, Hedden, Bomber, Lawrence, Strin. I called Jack McCarran one time at Strin in those early, early days. And I said, Jack, I want to be a field tester for strand. He said, what's a field tester? <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, I said, fishing with riders and, and doing fishing shows on strand products, strand lines. And uh, he said, well, we don't have anybody doing that, but we're going to talk about it. And if we do, you'll be our first promotional tester. And it, life, it, it came about that I was. They called me and they sent me a line. And I was buying strand when I could have picked up several other line sponsors, but I like, I, I love strand fishing line. 
and I promoted Strin for about 45 years. You know, you and I used to have the battle at the Bassmaster Classic for years and That's years. That's right. The Strin versus Trilene. I was the Trilene guy, you was the Strin guy, and we'd fight it out at the Classic. Yeah, I, t I remember telling you, we had a big crowd, and I said, I want you to look at Hanky Panky shoes. <laughs> They're loafers. He wears loafers all the time because he doesn't know how to tie knots. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even tie his shoe on, but all oh, that, those were fun times back then. And boy, I'd love to live them again. Good gosh, I'd love to live them again, and I know you would too. You're still living them, brother. You still got it going on more than anybody. I, you got more going on now than you've ever had, and you never show any signs of slowing down. And I was, uh, I, we're doing a uh, uh, Ron Howard's film crew out in California is doing a documentary on Dale Earnhardt. And so I was looking through my photographs, trying to find some old photographs. I bet you I found 50 things that uh, you have signed for me over the years. There's one, you got this big bass and you said, Hanks, Hank, thank you for allowing me to pose with your fish. I remember that. I love that. And then I stole your line. I don't. I didn't do it intentionally, but you used to say when you catch a bass, "You pretty thing." I say that all the time now. So I, I, I'm coming clean on the podcast here. I stole that from Bill. That so uh, I, I can't help it. But so they many are pretty. great memories, brother. I mean, so many great memories, and you are a pioneer, a staple. You're on the Mount Rushmore of bass fishing with Forrest and Ray, and uh, I, I think you're one of the most awesome guys, and I really appreciate well, your time you. today. I, I know you'd rather be fishing, but you took the time out to be on my podcast. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how much I love you. Today, it's 84 degrees in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, with a humidity probably around 45 and we've got a light north wind. Just a perfect, beautiful day to go fishing. And I said, no, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going, Hanky Panky wants me to be on his Zoom call. <laughs> and to the point, I said, I'm going to be on that show. So I said, it's more important that I do this for a dear, dear friend and a good, close friend. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going fishing today. I'm going I'm to fish with Hank today on this podcast and uh, reminisce about all the good times that we've had together over the years and the fine people that we've met that helped, uh, that helped you along and helped me along. Uh, we could talk six hours and probably still wouldn't get through <laughs> all the things we'd want to say. That's but you are, you're a very special person, Hank, and uh, a dear, dear friend of mine. And uh, I love you to death, buddy. Well, I sure do thank you. And I feel the love because if you gave up an 84-degree day to, to not go fishing and be on my podcast, I know you love me, man. That is so awesome. I do love you. I know, man. Thank you. Hey, I just I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll circle back the wagons. I look forward to seeing you down the road. And uh, I really honestly appreciate from the bottom of my heart you doing this. Thank you, my buddy. Uh, thank you, my friend. Love you so much. Right. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Goodbye, my buddy. And thank you for being with me today. God bless you. I'll see you next time. I'm Hank Parker.